Okay, this video is hypercoagulability, increased tendency to form blood clots. And what made me think of it is I've seen a whole bunch of strokes lately that were atypical. And the point being is they were primarily because the patients had systemic disease, meaning disease of the body, let's say from the neck down. Um, and it led to them becoming hypercoagulable and they subsequently had a stroke. And so there's a lot of things you can do. Plus, I've also had some colleagues ask me recently, you know, family members are going for surgery and they're going to have to stop their anticoagulation uh, medications. And they wanted to ask me, well, how much does that increase their risk for the stroke? And I've, I've stopped, you know, many, many hundreds of patients stopped their anticoagulation to do biopsies and uh, other invasive procedures. And I'm only aware of one of them having had a stroke from that. So it's rare, but it can happen, which is another reason why if you don't really need the biopsy, then why do it? You know, the average patient, they freak out when they hear the C word for cancer and they'll do anything. But they don't understand that a lot of times the risk of cancer is so low, it's ridiculous. Why even check for it? In addition, a lot of times the patient has so many other diseases, so much comorbidity that, you know, some minor nodule in their thyroid or something in that context it really doesn't matter too much okay and the doc they go to is obligated to recommend for recommend them for biopsy because that's the standard of care it's pretty rare that doctors will not go by the standard of care so they're going to recommend for the biopsy even if the patient's got you know major other comorbid problems probably that doesn't always happen but that's what usually happens okay so anyways i'm just going to go over some things a person can do to make themselves less prone to forming clots less hypercoagulable I got to get myself off the field here. I'll just go in the corner here. All right, so what are some of the things? Okay, blood clots are the most common cause of death. People have a tendency to think, oh, bleeding. You know, hardly anybody dies from bleeding, only in movies, okay? In real life, people die from a blood clot in the artery of the heart. That's a heart attack, myocardial infarction. Uh, blood clots in the brain, that's a stroke. Uh, blood clots in the chest, pulmonary emboli, for example, big uh, pulmonary artery, so they can't oxygenate their blood effectively. Okay, and there's a lot of things you don't think about, but they can cause uh, blood clotting. Uh, calcium supplements, when you get in high doses, are thought to increase the risk of blood clotting. They have like a 2.6 approximately increased <laughs> risk of death. They're so stupid. Calcium supplements when you're taking over 1,400 milligrams per day. Abnormally high hematocrits, and I think this was what was going on with these long-distance bicycle riders like the Tour de France when they were taking EPO, EPOETIN, that uh, increases their hematocrit. It might have been fine when they're going up a hill, but when they're just laying around having that high hematocrit, meaning high percentage of red blood cells in the blood, uh, predisposing them to clot. Okay, when it's cold, you vasoconstrict. Better to be warm. Stasis, so just sitting around all the time. Some people can't help it. You know, they're bedridden from uh, spinal cord injuries, um, post-surgical. Uh, but you want to get moving post-surgery. I can just tell you, you know, my aunt, family practice doctor, she was 78 years old, fell and broke her hip. Uh, went into the surgery, had a, you know open reduction, internal fixation, ORIF of her hip to fix the fracture. Okay, first day, she signed out AMA against medical advice, removed her own IVs. They said, aren't you in pain? She said, I don't care about the pain. I can deal with that. I just don't want to sit around here and get a DVT, deep vein thrombosis in the leg or a pulmonary embolism. And she did just fine, okay? Something similar with another friend of mine. He was a vascular surgeon. Well, he's more of a general surgeon, but he did some vascular surgery. Uh, he ended up going for open heart surgery. This is many years ago, uh, back before everybody knew about, you know, Ornish, Esselstyn, and all this stuff. And this is back in the 1980s. And the um, first day post-op after open heart surgery, signed out AMA, went home. <laughs> he's fine. The guy's a very good surgeon, by the way. Okay, so you want to keep moving. Just keep moving, you know. Like for me, when I'm studying, I have a tendency to sit at the desk too much, three hours, four hours, because I get into what I'm doing. and got to get up and walk. So go do some laundry, get something to eat, you know, just get some exercise for whatever reason. Uh, so it's good for a person to keep moving. Some people have standing desks. Some people have treadmill desks just to kind of keep moving. And, and a lot of times people don't get a major blood clot for just one reason. Quite often it's multiple reasons. So it's just good to be aware of them. Uh, hypertension over time causes atherosclerosis, which really is a blood clot and can narrow a vessel and predispose it to more uh, clotting in the future. Diabetes uh, causes increased uh, tendency to clot for multiple reasons. So the typical diabetic just says it's under control, I'm taking my pills, my sugars are okay, but that's ignorant. What they really should be doing is optimizing their diet and hopefully try to reverse it, especially these you know type 2 diabetics who are overweight. Elevated uric acid after eating meat or high fructose corn syrup, that'll, you know, not only is uric acid a bridging molecule, it also inhibits endothelial nitric oxide synthase, the vasodilator production. Elevated fibrinogen, which is an acute phase reactant protein released by the liver in the context of stress, for example. So same thing with stress equivalents, sleep deprivation, uh, caffeine, for example, so you don't want to be doing that. Excessive dietary fat. 
Uh, dietary fat in general, you know, we tend to think of saturated fat especially. It's causing, um, you know, hyperlipidemia in a way that predisposes to clotting. But the other fats, in the long run, they also are, are harmful. Uh, you also get uh, blood sludge effect with um, PUFAs, like the omega-6 cooking oils, and even the omega-3s, which although they can lower triglycerides, have a slight anticoagulant effect, over time they make you fat and they cause insulin resistance, so they, they don't really uh, do much for your blood. Plus, like I said, I did thousands of procedures. We never even paid any attention to omega-3. I considered it a joke. Um, it never affected any single uh, procedure operation. Okay, dehydration. Uh, being dehydrated concentrates your blood, elevates your hematocrit a little bit. That makes you slightly more prothrombotic. Uh, so staying well hydrated can help. But you got to be careful at night. You don't want to hydrate right before you go to bed. Then you got to wake up and void, and then you get sleep deprivation. So you don't win with that. Um, good to hydrate in the morning. Okay, uh, cancer. Uh, cancer increases a person's risk of forming a clot, especially certain cancers, aggressive cancers, metastatic cancer, pancreatic cancer, things like that, brain tumors. Um, leaky gut and leaky gums. I'm going to have an additional slide on this, but there are lots of things that cause leaky guts and leaky gums, and that includes artificial sweeteners. So you want to be careful about all that stuff. LPS is lipopolysaccharide. That's the endotoxin from gram-negative bacteria. LTA is lipotychoic acid. That's the endotoxin from gram-positive bacteria, and those form especially uh, refractory clots that are difficult for the body to dissolve. They're called amyloidogenic clots amyloid clots. I gave some lectures on that. Excessive free iron, which tends to happen over time, you know, with men starting in their, you know, let's say late 20s, early 30s, they start gradually becoming iron overloaded. Women, when they're postmenopausal, because they're no longer menstruating, and that can uh, slightly increase their risk of clotting. That gets into the work of Douglas Kell and Etheresia Pretorius. I gave lectures about them. Uh, having genetically high LPA. I'm kind of in the process of reading about LPA some more. A friend of mine had an elevated LPA, and they'll tell you you can't change uh, but he saw his change, and so I recently checked mine. i got to get my labs back. I'm curious what it's going to be. Um, LPA is not that simple, though. We'll talk about it in a future lecture. Uh, protein S and C deficiency. You can also have kidney problems that lead to problems with this. Kidney failure in general makes people more prothrombotic. You look at the, you know, the CT scans on these kidney failure patients, especially the ones that are on dialysis. All their arteries are calcified all over the place. It's a disaster. Some of these, you know, congenital problems, I'm not going to get into these too much. Um, these are all things you can check in a person's blood if they have a clotting problem. Uh, but for everybody, all of this other stuff is, is relevant. Uh, splenectomy is relevant. Trauma to the vessels, birth control pills, estrogen overload. Estrogen itself is a little bit prothrombotic. Um, estrogen replacement therapy. Okay, relatively mild, but all these things can add up. Trauma to the vessels, uh, radiation therapy, alcohol. These are all things that can kind of add up. Here's what I wanted to show you is that leaky gut's a big deal because, let me get off the screen here, leaky gut's a big deal because, you know, once you get an opening up of these tight junctions due to especially lack of dietary fiber, then all these things listed here, there's a whole bunch of things, uh, will have a tendency to increase the risk of leaky gut because then you can start getting bacteria and their endotoxins across the single cell layer, the epithelium of the gut, the enterocytes, and these can be very uh, prothrombotic. So you don't want this stuff. Okay, that's another reason why, you know, I won't take a NSAID or an aspirin. I think they're totally overrated. Um, I won't eat foods that uh, increase the risk of this. So here's the whole list. If you're interested in that, you can go through that. Also, it'll help protect you from autoimmune disease to avoid all these things. I just avoid all of them. It's easy for me to do it. Okay, here's the kind of workup. It's kind of expensive. They'll run all these tests if they don't know why you form the clot. Um, Hyperlipidemia increases your risk of clotting. That's common to everybody. Diabetes increases your risk of forming clots in multiple different ways. Diabetes is a much worse disease than people realize. A lot of people think, oh, pre-diabetes, diabetes is no big deal. They keep saying it's under control. My sugar's okay. I'm taking my pills. They don't understand. They're headed for disaster unless they get their act together. Okay, Verkhoff's tried. Increases the risk of clotting. Uh, the things you can do, like we just talked about, eat the low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet, avoid all the things that cause leaky gut, stay hydrated during the daytime, don't do stupid stuff like taking high-dose calcium supplements, um, and, you know, keep moving, get some exercise, move around, uh, you know, I do a lot of little things, like when I get a phone call, if I'm, if I'm working and I'm at my desk, I'll stand up when I talk on the phone, things like that, um, I'll take the stairs instead of the elevator, I will park far instead of close do a whole bunch of little things to make myself walk around. I use the bathroom on another floor, so i got to walk up some stairs. So anyways, um, I'll eat, I eat a very low-fat diet, which also helps prevent these clotting problems. 
Uh, so, anyways, hope that was helpful.